I want to thank Allison Gill for agreeing to do this presentation as part of Gender Spectrum September Education Programming. The research she's presenting is critical as it illustrates how gender is something that affects all students in relation to health, school climate, and academic achievement. In a time when there is still so little research related to gender identity and expression in schools, I'm grateful to Allison, Advocates for Youth, and the many people who have been advocating for LGBTQ inclusive data collection for decades. Before I turn this over to Allison, here's a little bit about her. Allison Gill is an accomplished attorney and a nationally recognized expert on LGBTQ law. She currently works as a consultant to foundations and nonprofits focusing on advocacy, strategy, and systemic change. Prior to her consultancy work, Allison served as senior legislative counsel at the Human Rights Campaign, where she managed state level advocacy concerning conversion therapy, anti bullying, education, non discrimination, trans issues, LGBTQ health and, wellness, health and wellness, HIV policy, youth homelessness, and LGBTQ data collection. Allison, thanks again for agreeing to do this and sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kim. I'm really excited to be able to present to you all today on this exciting new research um, and this new data on gender expansive young people. So with that, let me move into our agenda for this, um, this seminar. We're going to be first just talking briefly about who we mean by gender expansive youth. Then we're going to be talking about the gender exp expression question that was added to the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is the source of this new data. And finally, we're going to talk about the report uh, on health risk behaviors and the outcomes. It's a new data that's available. So moving forward, let's start with who are gender expansive youth? So this is a broad term. We're using this as a broad term to mean young people who, whose gender expression does not fit traditional roles based on their sex assigned at birth. Now there are a lot of different terms people use for young people that might, might be classified as gender expansive youth, including things like genderqueer, gender nonconforming, non-binary. Um, and a lot of these youth might not actually use any label to describe themselves. Uh, a significant portion may just identify um, without a label at all. But we do know that gender expansive youth experience discrimination and disparate health risk behaviors compared to other young people. So far, however, there's been very limited population-based data for research, which means data where you survey a whole population of students and identify those young people that are um, uh, gender expansive and, and look at their health risk behaviors. So the data we do have available for gender expansive youth really comes primarily from small group studies. And these studies have been mostly done among um, uh, retrospective studies among adult LGB, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people who are gender non who say that they were gender nonconforming as youth. So you can see that's very limited. We're talking about small group studies, studies that vary in size from maybe 30 to a couple hundred people, and they're among adults and retrospective. So we're really lacking the input of, of youth who are currently gender expansive and facing uh, health risk behaviors and, and discrimination. Uh, particularly notable is that the previous research completely lacks uh, data on certain groups of gender expansive young people, particularly gender expansive young people who are heterosexual, since it's focused primarily on lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. So even with all those caveats, we do know that gender nonconformity is associated with bullying and harassment, rejection by peers, poor relationships with parents, um, sexual harassment and abuse. And this sort of victimization has negative health consequences, which we see among these populations, including higher rates of substance use, decreased educational outcomes, increased depression and suicidality, and post-traumatic stress. So this research that I'm going to talk about with you today focuses on population-based data, which is data from broad uh, national surveys uh, regard and how we can look at gender expansive young people and gender expansive uh, gender expression as a category within those surveys. So I'll start with the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. This is a, the nation's primary survey concerning uh, youth and health risk behaviors. It's conducted among secondary school age youth, which means middle school and high school. And it's conducted within 47 states and about 20 large school districts around the country and also a variety of territories like Guam. 
and it looks at risk behaviors. And that's a, that's a broad and sort of specific category that includes things like substance use, smoking, violence, bullying, suicidality, weight, inactivity, and also nutrition. So there's a broad range of questions on this survey. And it consists of a core survey, which is determined by the CDC, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and an optional list of questions that the CDC approves and provides to each of the sites that conduct the survey. Each individual site, that is each state or large municipality, decides what questions will be used, usually by taking the core survey and choosing additional optional questions from CDC's list to add to it until they reach about 99 questions. That's the maximum limit for the survey. And uh, starting in 2013, uh, there are two sexual orientation questions which are part of the core survey. Prior to that, they were optional questions. So there are questions about sexual orientation on the core survey, which means municipalities and states will use those questions unless they affirmatively opt to take them off the core survey and not include them in their local surveys. I'll note that there is currently no approved question regarding transgender young people. So there's no question specifically about trans youth, and that's for a variety of reasons that I won't get into here, um, mostly to do with population size. Um, so let's move on and talk about this new question. The current YRBS question, um, as I mentioned, the optional questions pertaining to sexual orientation were available for years. However, there's been a long time gap regarding gender minority youth, meaning gender expansive youth and transgender young people. The All Students Count Coalition, which is a national group of organizations working on increasing data collection pertaining to LGBTQ young people, worked with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and researchers to identify appropriate questions for transgender and gender nonconforming youth. In GLSEN, the Gay Lesbian Straight Education Network performed cognitive and pilot testing on the relevant questions that were identified. Based on this question, uh, testing, the CDC adopted um, an approved gender expression question available for sites to use in 2013. The research was not as uh, conclusive on a trans question, so it is no trans question has been adopted yet as an optional question. Since 2013, um, the question has been used in a few sites, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. So without further ado, here is the question that was adopted as an optional question. A person's appearance, style, or dress, or the way they walk or talk may affect how people describe them. How do you think other people at school would describe you? And you can see there's a range of responses varying from very feminine to very masculine, seven, seven possible responses. Now note that this question does not expressly cover transgender youth. Uh, it's not, there's no way to identify who might be or may not be transgender based on this question. And the question looks at a construct called socially assigned gender expression. It doesn't ask what a how a person identifies. It asks how other people perceive them. And the reason for this is because we know that a lot of victimization due to gender expression is based on other people's um, opinions and, and thoughts and the way they are treated by other people. So this helps us understand uh, the level of victimization, if any, that the gender nonconforming people are subject to. Oops. So beginning in 2013, there were four sites that used this new question, Broward County, Florida, Chicago, Illinois, Los Angeles, California, and San Diego, California. And the sites used the question in both 2013 and 2015. The Youth Risk Behavior Survey is a survey that occurs every other year. However, until now, the data has never been thoroughly analyzed. It's just been collected and it never was analyzed to see, well, what are the results? What sort of health risk behaviors are gender expansive youth subject to? What is their disproportionate risk? So fortunately, the question has since been analyzed and we were able to put out a new report based on this analysis in September of 2016. So this new report is now available on the Advocates for Youth website. Uh, the link is below. And it provides a wealth of data about gender expansive young people and risk behaviors based on this new, based on the youth risk behavior survey. Um, just a note about demographics. The survey data we were able to collect from those four sites includes over 9,000 young people. So a total of 9,000, a portion of which are, are gender nonconforming, um, not the majority. And the, there is a 
based on the sites, there was a very diverse, race, diverse racial breakdown with about a quarter of the young people identifying as Hispanic Latino, about a quarter identifying as white, a quarter uh, identifying as black, and about 20% identifying as Asian or Pacific Islander. So it was very diverse in terms of race. Uh, the, the about 12.4 percent of the break of the young people who responded to the, these questions identified as sexual minority youth, uh, basically indicating that they were gay, lesbian, bisexual, or they are unsure about their sexual orientation at that time. So with this, let me break down some of the data for you. So first, this chart looks at um, responses to the gender expression question broken down by sex. And so you can see um, that the majority of males, for example, identified as somewhat masculine, mostly masculine or very masculine, and a much smaller percentage identified as very mostly or somewhat feminine. And the same uh, opposite for females. Um, the majority of females identified as very feminine, mostly feminine or somewhat feminine, with significantly smaller numbers identifying as somewhat masculine or mostly masculine. In fact, uh, the portion that identified as very masculine was so small that we combined it uh, into the mostly masculine category for analysis purposes, because it was too small to an analyze on its own. So in analyzing this question, we analyzed it both across the entire range in a continuous way. So looking at how does this relationship um, how, do, how does it work over time, over the period of responses based on um, each individual risk factor? It was also analyzed in three categories. So we categorized very mostly and somewhat feminine um, girls, uh, females, for example, as uh, feminine females, and somewhat mostly and very masculine females as uh, masculine females. And in the middle, you see there's a category for equally feminine and masculine. And those uh, were categorized as androgynous. The breakdown is about um, almost equal numbers of both males and females identifying as equally feminine and masculine. It's about 10% to 11% there. Uh, for males, it was about 14.3% 14, 14 identifying as uh, very through somewhat feminine. And for females, it was about 3.7% 3, 3 identifying as somewhat through very masculine. Um, and finally, let me note that this data was analyzed across about 60 different risk behaviors that are surveyed through the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And I'm going to present a small amount of that data, but the entire range of the data is available in the report I mentioned before. So we saw in analyzing data really four distinct ways that um, gender expression is related to when it's associated with a risk behavior, four distinct ways where you can view this relationship. Uh, for example, we, when we looked at did not eat, used diet products, or vomited to lose weight among males by gender expression, you see that there's sort of a linear positive relationship so that the more gender nonconforming uh, an individual is from uh, equally feminine to masculine to, to very feminine, the more likely to have, they are to have engaged in that, in that risk behavior. So it varies from about five, uh, 7 to about 35 percent uh, for very feminine. So it's about a sevenfold increase over the entire range, which is fairly dramatic. Below that, there is a linear negative relationship for physically active at least 60 minutes per day. So this is a protective factor for young people that are physically active, um, and you can see that the the very feminine, most, I'm sorry, very masculine and mostly masculine males were significantly more likely to report that they were physically active compared to mostly and very feminine um, males. So there's a, there's a negative linear relationship there. On the other side, you see quadratic relationships where the, um, it varies not based on the edge of the range, like very masculine or very feminine, but where the, and basically the ends of the range, very masculine and very feminine, have a dramatically increased likelihood of this risk behavior, which is carrying a gun. And you can see it's around 6.6% for very masculine males and about 12% for very feminine males. And those at least risk for this risk behavior were actually the androgynous males in the middle. 
and it's exactly the opposite below for feeling sad or hopeless among females, where we see that the, the uh, females identified as androgynous were significantly greater risk than either the mostly very masculine females or the very feminine females. We also looked at sexual orientation and gender expression. And this chart breaks down for each response by sex, uh, very masculine to very feminine, those young people who identified as a sexual minority, that is lesbian, gay, bisexual, or other. And you can see it's an important thing to note is that the majority of gender expansive youth are heterosexual. So the majority of males, for example, that identified as equally feminine, masculine, somewhat feminine, uh, mostly feminine or very feminine are heterosexual. And the same is true for, for females, um, which is, is notable because a lot of people uh, think that risk behavior faced by gender expansive youth is due to uh, perception about their sexuality. When in fact, we show that that is, is not always the case, that they face unique and independent uh, risk behaviors. And so that's the second takeaway, gender expression is a predictor of health risk that's independent of sex or sexual orientation. So and that means it's important to ask both questions when you're doing surveys, uh, so that because it predicts different risks differently than sexual orientation. Uh, gender, gender expansive young people have different, a different risk profile, basically. And so I'm going to just present a few selected stats for each of the categories. Um, this category, for example, these stats, for example, are for feminine males. So that's males identified as somewhat very or mostly um, feminine. And you can see compared to masculine males, feminine males were three times more likely to uh, feel unsafe at school, to have been electric electronically bullied, three times more likely to have attempted suicide, two times more likely to have had sexual intercourse before age 13, and four times more likely to have um, used amphetamines and four times more likely to have been physically forced to have sexual intercourse. So this is a significant increase, very significant in each of these categories. And this is just a selection. There's a, a great deal of more um, categories. And I mentioned there's about 60 different risk factors that are looked at in the report. Among masculine females, we saw that they were seven times more likely to have carried a weapon on school property than, than feminine females. Uh, four times more likely to have used heroin, four times more likely to have had sexual intercourse before age 13, two times more likely to have had sexual intercourse with four or more persons, four times more likely to have smoked at school, and five times more likely to have currently smoke, currently used, currently used smokeless tobacco. So this is also a significantly increased uh, compared to feminine females. And lastly, I just wanted to pull some statistics for androgynous females where we saw a different risk profile. I mentioned previously that sometimes it's the androgynous um, individuals who are at the greatest risk. This is particularly true among androgynous females, where we saw that they were 1.5 times more likely to be physically forced to have sexual intercourse, um, 1.5 times more likely to seriously consider attempting suicide, 1.5 times more likely to, to conduct non-suicide self-injury, for example, cutting, two times more likely to have been electronically bullied, and two times more likely to have had sexual intercourse before age 13 compared to feminine females. So there's an increased risk uh, for androgynous females as well that's different than for masculine females. So some key takeaways. First of all, we found there was no relationship between gender expression and age or race. So this is an independent predictor of health risk. Um, while gender nonconformity is associated with sexual orientation, the vast majority of gender expansive students are heterosexual. And gender expression is an independent predictor of, uh, should be independent predictor of, uh, oh, gender expression is a predictor of risk that is independent of sexual orientation. Gender expansive students are, are also at a higher risk for the majority of health risk behaviors analyzed. So majority of the 60 different health risk behaviors that we looked at in this, in this report, including things like bullying, drug use, and suicidality. And because of this, they're also less likely than their peers to succeed academically, which is another um, outcome looked at in the report. And for some risk behaviors, it's not the most um, gender non-conforming individuals who are at greatest risk, it's often androgynous students, particularly among females. 
And so I wanted to present a few resources um, that are available from Gender Spectrum on, on these topics, including uh, the links below. And finally, I want to thank Gender Spectrum for allowing me to present and say that I'm available for questions. Here's my contact information. Uh, also, Advocates for Youth has available resources relating to the study and others, and the link for that is below. Thank you. Hi, and I just want to thank Allison for this wonderful presentation and encourage you both to contact Allison with specific questions and also to review the Gender Spectrum website for more resources and also to con you can also contact us through our website. Thanks so much, Allison. Thank you.